So I want to welcome all of you to uh, this webinar. For those who don't know me, I'm Roger Wakimoto, the Vice Chancellor for Research. Uh, this is another in a series of town halls that have been hosted by my office. Uh, clearly, this is a very important topic, and I can tell just by the number of people that have registered for it. I can't thank enough uh, Dean Ron Brookmeyer and the panelists who will be introduced shortly for participating. I think you all know the topic. It's COVID-19 planning and preparedness at UCLA. Just to give you a, a broad overview, we're going to try to have about 30 minutes of presentations and hopefully about 45 minutes for Q&A. I want to reiterate, if you weren't aware, that this webinar will be recorded. But the reason why it's being recorded is because uh, the intention is to post this so you can view it later. It'll be posted on my uh, website. A little logistics in terms of the Q&A uh, period. For those who are tuning in on Zoom, you'll see the Q&A chat box. And you can uh, enter your question there. And you can do so either anonymously. Or if you want, you can show your name. It's really your choice. Uh, for those who might be tuning in at YouTube, it, it's great. But realize that if you are coming in on YouTube, you will not be able to uh, ask questions, but you will be able to view the webinar. Uh, both myself and Dean Brookmeyer will be modifying the Q&A. We're gonna try to select the questions. It's physically, not impos it's physically impossible to ask all the questions. We're also gonna select a few from those that submitted them before the town hall. And thank you for those that did submit those questions. So I think those are the ground rules. So without any further delay, I want to introduce Dean Ron Brookmeyer, who's going to introduce the panelists and also have opening remarks. Thank you, Roger. And uh, thank you, everyone, for being here with us today. Our, our goal is to provide information about the risks of uh, transmission of COVID-19 and what UCLA is doing to mitigate those risks. The uh, COVID-19 Future Planning Task Force, which I chair, uh, works in partnership with the Research Ramp-Up Committee that Vice Chancellor Roger Wakimoto chairs. And we're working to develop plans to address a situation that is changing every day. And the numbers of cases, the trends that we're seeing are, are changing. And even just today, new public health control measures have been announced in California. The task force has a number of working groups focusing on different aspects of the pandemic and the UCLA response. And I'm very pleased that we have the chairs from four of the working groups with us today who will each make short presentations and then address your questions. So let me introduce our panelists. Uh, Peter Katona chairs the Infection Control Working Group. Uh, Peter is a clinical professor of infectious diseases with an appointment at the UCLA Fielding School of Public Health. He has worked at the Centers for Disease Control, studying viral diseases. Michelle Sityart chairs the Symptom and Temperature Screening Working Group. Michelle is the Executive Officer of UCLA Environment, Health, and Safety and also is a director of the UCLA Emergency Operations Center for the COVID-19 pandemic. An industrial hygienist, uh, Michelle is an expert on health and safety in the workplace. Nurit Katz chairs the Physical Distancing Working Group. Nurit is the Operations Section Chief in the Emergency Operations Center and is UCLA's first Chief Sustainability Officer. John Ballard cha chairs the Testing and Contact Tracing Working Group. John is the Interim Executive Director at UCLA Arthur Ashe's Student Health Center and has served as Ashe's Chief of Operations and Chief Financial Officer for over 10 years. Now, I'm grateful to all of our panelists today for being here and for all the work that they are doing to address the COVID-19 pandemic at UCLA. So without any further ado, I'd like to turn to our first panelist, Peter Katona, for his remarks. Thank you, Ron. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we're at a crucial time right now. The COVID-19 pandemic is worsening locally as it is in California and much of the United States. There is mask-defiant backlash 
political squabbles, a proliferation of fake news, and despite large numbers, a shortage of testing capability. Three age groups are now emerging. The less than 18 year olds who don't seem to get very symptomatic, the 18 to 44 year olds who now compose 40% of LA County's cases, and the elderly who if infected have high morbidity and mortality. So how did this virus do so much damage so quickly? It's highly contagious, it mutates, and it kills. It's new, so we have no immunity. Our response has been horrific compared to many other countries. And there are a number of reasons for this, and they include a late recognition, poor messaging and resource allocation coordination, poor adherence to masks, distancing and hand washing, and inadequate testing and contact tracing. But what about stats and data trajectories and communicable infection control? We have to be cautious regarding raw stats. Think more about trajectories and seven-day seven averages, for example. Think about the epidemic curve of new cases over time flattening. In other words, tall and thin to short and fat to avoid a medical surge, which is currently happening in Houston, Texas, and El Centro, California, and the Imperial Valley, prompting medical AeroVax and a pivot on reopening. Reported stats from so many sources can be misleading. The number of cases identified are not the number inf of infected. And this reflects the number of tests done and the politics of picking what you want reported. The percent tests that are positive reflects how focused you are and how much of what you suspect is identified. The number of hospitalizations can come from many causes, and it helps to compare to past years. Texas even stopped reporting this recently. ICU admits are a better indicator, but also applies to any severe disease. And the number of deaths or the case fatality rate is not the infection fatality rate, which is clearly lower. Case fatality rate includes COVID deaths ascribed to other causes, and doesn't include non-COVID deaths that actually were COVID without a positive test. And we can only estimate the all important date of acquisition or by whom or where. Good contact tracing requires not only lots of con contact tracers, but a system and a quick test result. PCR and that antigen testing doesn't tell us if we have live virus, only the presence of viral RNA and websites usually report raw numbers, not population-based statistics. So why is COVID so much worse than seasonal flu? Seasonal flu typically kills 30 to 60,000 Americans a year, but cases are typically spread out over the winter months, so there's no need for curve flattening. COVID is more co contagious. It has a longer incubation period, enabling a greater spread prior to symptom onset. And we don't know about differences in immunity yet. Spanish flu had three waves, the second being the worst, and this pandemic eventually killed 675,000 Americans. So infection control means minimizing the perceived risk tolerance of transmission. And COVID transmission mechanisms are twofold. There's a respiratory one with droplets being larger particles that don't go too far in the air being different from smaller aerosized particles that can travel farther in the air. Aerosized virus can remain suspended for three hours, especially indoors. Transmission occurs by mere breathing, but in proximity to others. Could be coughing, sneezing, singing, cheering, yelling, chatting in a bar, exercising at a gym. Surface contamination, on the other hand, is spread by touch. And some cases are going to be community spread, which in other words means we don't know how they got it. Now, as far as clinical cases go, the symptomatic should seek medical attention quickly. Early recognition of asymptomatic spread is harder. Unlike SARS, which had no asymptomatic transmission, asymptomatics account for 30 to 60% of COVID cases. And it would be so much easier to control without these asymptomatic shedders. There are three reasons for late recognition initially faulty scientific assumptions, academic rivalries, but most important, there was a reluctance to accept politically that containing the virus would take drastic economic measures. 
There are two asymptomatic subclasses, the chronically asymptomatic and the pre-symptomatic who are in the midst of about a five-day incubation. Asymptomatics make the need for masks and distancing all the more important. Identifying these people and isolating them is why we need more testing, but they've had a low test pot priority because of the scarcity of tests. Surface contamination is important. We have a lot of data, but experiments were done in indoor labs, not in the real world. Actual viability was not measured by PCR, and it's too dangerous to do viral cultures. So questions plague us. How much is an effective infectious dose? How important is the duration of contact? How actually, how aggressively do you need to clean? And surface stability varies on different surfaces. Copper, four hours, cardboard, 24 hours, plastic and stainless steel, maybe two to three days. So what do you do about groceries, delivery boxes, containers, or even tennis balls? Most any surface, by the way, is virus-free after a few days, having said all that. And virus is easily killed with soap, sanitizers, alcohol, or Clorox. What about social distancing, keeping us apart from others? Well, you can start with draconian lockdowns like they've had in Wuhan, China, and Panama. You go to stay-at-home directives, as our governor in California has had. You can avoid crowds in general. You can avoid going to bars and restaurants or just maintain that six foot distance. But consider there's a difference between indoors and outdoors, difference between whether you're talking face to face, how much contact time you have. And maybe even a bigger question is, does distancing merely delay until vaccine or does it actually deprive the virus of the ability to propagate? How do we know that social distancing works? Well, there is historic precedent. During Spanish flu, US cities that applied early, sustained, layered, non-pharmacocentric interventions, including quarantine, self-isolation, school closures, and social distancing, experienced the greatest reductions in weekly death rates, while many cities that deactivated these measures early experienced two peaks in mortality. What about face masks? N95s, KN95, surgical masks, cloth facial varieties. They're all effective with differences in level of protection. But there's shortages, hoarding, reuse, sterilization devices, fraudulent sales, layer issues, different cleaning protocols, and of course, saving masks for healthcare workers, all making it quite confusing. And remember, masks are philanthropic. They protect others more than they protect you. And do they really help? Well, the report looked at 172 observational studies across 16 countries in 26,000 patients and, and found that at a distancing of one meter or more, that mask use could result in large reductions in the risk of infection. So in conclusion, infection prevention and control is not limited to the hospital. We need to be extremely vigilant with our infection control practices to minimize transmission. As cases are increasing rapidly here and across the country, and COVID-19 is mutating in unpredictable ways, it's becoming more contagious. This means testing, hand washing, masking, social distancing, staying away from others as much as possible are important. We need to listen mostly to public health authorities, but also listen to what economists and politicians are saying and hope they can all agree on the best practices. Choosing between public health and reopening is the wrong question. We should be looking for intelligent ways to reopen, but with compromises. There's hope for an effective treatment and vaccine. We have resources, but not the will yet. We'll make exceptions to the rules here locally as well as at the university, and we'll try to minimize them. Remember the infection control basics. Do good surveillance, identify patients who are infected, isolate them, contact trace, and quarantine them, and do this all quickly and efficiently. I'll now turn it over to Michelle, the next speaker. Thank you, Peter, and hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining. Uh, today, I'll be providing an overview of the symptom monitoring and temperature screening processes at UCLA and what that means for you as our campus affiliates uh, as we continue to navigate these unprecedented times and the necessary public health mitigations that go along with it. 
In accordance with LA County Department of Public Health order that was issued back in spring, uh, which obligated businesses to monitor its employees for COVID-19 symptoms, uh, the Emergency Operations Center partnered with UCLA Health to develop an online symptom monitoring survey for campus, basically mirroring what had been established for UCLA Health employees and our healthcare workers. Uh, and completion of the survey was required for employees who needed to come to campus for work, either partial or full time. This has now expanded to other constituents in light of the research ramp up and current stage of resumption and more recently to our student population with the return of certain groups, including our student athletes. A separate survey instance has now also been designed for our pre K through 12 facilities and another for non UCLA affiliates that would, for example, cover our third party contract workers and our clients working in core facilities. Protocols have been developed for each survey, which outline the instructions and details for access and the steps that would need to be taken following completion. The symptom survey itself takes less than five minutes to complete and it asks uh, if, there are, if individuals are experiencing any COVID-19 related symptoms, uh, whether or not they are awaiting test results, uh, have been instructed to quarantine, uh, self-isolate, et cetera. Uh, the individual uh, is cleared, a clearance certificate will be issued at the end of the survey. If the responses trigger a not cleared status, however, the individual will be prompted to contact the UCLA Infectious Disease Hotline if they're an employee, uh, the ASH COVID-19 Hotline if they are a student, or their primary care physician for the pre-K through 12 children. The appropriate medical professionals will then provide further instruction on testing, isolation, quarantine, and further monitoring, as well as clearances for return to work or other activities on campus. And in terms of data privacy, uh, survey data are kept confidential, and the data is only retained for 30 days for case investigation and contact tracing purposes, then purged from the system following the retention period. The privacy notice is linked at the start of each survey, which provides details on those terms. In addition to the online symptom survey, certain higher risk groups have been conducting on-site temperature checks in accordance with the UCLA temperature screening guidelines. This includes our custodial and maintenance groups working in healthcare facilities, research laboratories conducting COVID-19 work, our division of lab animal and medicine, and our student athletes, to name a few. There's no explicit requirement to perform on-site temperature checks under current county order at this time, though UCLA is doing this as an added mitigation effort in the best interest of our campus community. We are in discussions now about how, to, how we might expand this to other areas on campus where we will see higher densities as we continue to repopulate the campus. The idea being that temperature screenings could be deployed at the entrances of select buildings, uh, but again, those locations and the final decision have yet to be confirmed with our infection control experts. We are also contemplating the use of thermal imaging cameras and are in the process of conducting a study with the School of Engineering now uh, for a pilot that can be deployed at one of our dining halls. The details of this project are, are pending the results of the study uh, and further coordination with leadership on how to best implement. To that end, these mitigation practices are coupled with the identification of COVID positive cases. In those instances, departments are to follow the standard operating procedure for reporting COVID-19 cases to the appropriate campus authorities, as well as processes to initiate cleaning and disinfection of spaces upon learning of impacted areas. This SOP, along with the symptom monitoring protocols and temperature screening guidelines and, and all other EOC developed COVID-19 resources, including guidance on face coverings, safe and physical distancing and others are all posted to Bruin Safe online. And I encourage you all to familiarize yourselves with them at your leisure. So on that note, I will turn it over to Nareet Katz who will speak on the enhanced cleaning and disinfection protocols that are being followed on campus. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Michelle, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'll be speaking a bit to the cleaning and disinfecting plans for UCLA. Uh, facilities management has examined industry best practices nationally and coordinated uh, across UC uh, to develop cleaning and disinfection protocols for COVID-19. These protocols were then reviewed and improved, uh, approved by the Infection Control Working Group of the Future Planning Task Force. You heard from the chair, Peter Katona, today. Um, which includes UCLA health and public health experts. 
So the main shift in our campus cleaning practices uh, to address COVID-19 is a focus on high touch surfaces. Uh, that are likely to, to be exposed. That includes you know, doorknobs, light switches, tables and countertops, elevator buttons, et cetera. So these areas will be cleaned twice a day, once during the day, as well as once at night. Uh, for classrooms, once we resume some level of on-site instruction, um, the classrooms will be cleaned at least once daily and the high touch points twice daily. In between classes, uh, we will be providing disinfecting wipes so that students may wipe down the surfaces before they sit and faculty can wipe down the AV equipment as well. Um, for laboratories, researchers will continue to disinfect their research areas with their approved disinfectants that are appropriate for their lab areas. In addition to this, facilities management is providing disinfecting kits for sale for departments um, that you can purchase. And uh, you know, these will allow for supplemental disinfecting if people choose. Um, those kits and the pricing are available at facilities.ucla.edu slash COVID-19 and we'll send out that link in the follow-up as well. Um, in order to make this enhanced disinfecting that we're doing possible given limited staffing and budget, um, we've made adjustments to the ordinary cleaning practices and also waste collection practices for the campus. So that includes shifting some of our personnel from evening operations to day operations. Um, we're also changing to centralized waste collection, which you may have heard about in your buildings, um, where we won't be doing the desk side waste pickup, but people will empty their waste bins into a centralized bin. And there will be some reduction in uh, normal services, such as uh, stairwell cleaning outside of handrails um, and you know, dusting and things like that, where the frequency will be reduced in order to increase this focus on high touch surfaces. In addition to these cleaning protocols, facilities management also develop a specialized response for any areas where there's been exposure due to a positive COVID-19 case. So facilities management custodial has dedicated trained personnel and the methodology that's being used is called electrostatic spraying. So the electrostatic charge of the sprayer allows the droplets to attract the surface instead of uh, floating in the air like with a mister or a fogger. So this is actually safer for our workers. Um, and the company that we are using has conducted OSHA and NIOSH third-party testing to ensure there aren't safety concerns uh, for acute or long-term worker exposure. We've also ensured that all the disinfectants that we're using are reviewed against the EPA list in terms of effectiveness against the coronavirus and safety for humans. So this protocol is described in more detail in the same SOP that Michelle just referenced uh, for positive cases at UCLA. And you can find that along with a lot of other helpful guidelines at, again, bso.ucla.edu. Uh, so that is the high-level summary of what's being done in terms of cleaning and disinfecting at UCLA. And again, uh, more detailed protocols uh, available in that SOP for positive cases. And then the detailed list of custodial protocols and the disinfecting kits are at facilities.ucla.edu slash COVID-19. Thank you. And um, now I will be uh, passing the baton to uh, John Bollard, who is the executive director of the Ash Center and also the chair of the contact tracing and testing working group. All yours, John. Thank you, Nareet. And thank you all for participating today. It's a real pleasure to be with you. You know, people are slowly returning to campus. Researchers, athletes, folks in training programs. A small number of faculty and staff are returning, and as the summer progresses, more and more programs will be restarted. We know that a number of students have stayed in the vicinity, living in the Westwood area throughout this period since we went to remote learning in March. But in a few months, we're gonna have thousands of students returning to Westwood and to UCLA. They'll be moving into the residence halls, albeit in smaller numbers than before. They'll be moving into fraternity and sorority houses and into apartments in Westwood. All of this, of course, while we are experiencing a worldwide pandemic. And these students, of course, will be coming from all over the country and all over the world. So we all have to put our best efforts forward to contain and control the spread of this virus. So I'd like to spend just a few minutes today telling you about what efforts are currently underway at UCLA in the areas of testing, contact tracing, and isolation. 
and to talk a little bit about our plans for the fall. The Ash Student Health Center will be coordinating testing efforts on campus for students, as well as contact tracing efforts for students, faculty, and staff. At the Ash Center, we've already tested more than 500 students, and we've had, we're aware of 50 students as of last evening who have tested positive for COVID. We're currently monitoring about 100 students who still remain in isolation or in quarantine. We are absolutely convinced that along with the preventative measures of mask wearing, of appropriate distancing and hand washing, that a tightly coordinated effort of identification, of testing, of contact tracing, and of isolation are going to be key to containment. So I'd like to just very briefly walk through each of these different uh, aspects of the process. And I should say that while there is a process that's been in place for students, there is a parallel process for faculty and staff when it comes to testing, <clears throat> excuse me, contact tracing and isolation. So as uh, my colleague Michelle said, when the, the um, UCLA member completes their survey, they'll have a response that either tells them that they're cleared to return to campus. This is my iPhone with a survey, by the way. They are cleared to return to campus or not. And if they're not cleared to return to campus and to enter key locations on campus, they're gonna be directed to call the ASH infection control line if they're students or a similar occupational health infection control line. They will speak with a medical professional who will quickly assess the situation and see if they need to come in for testing. If they do, we will schedule testing immediately and direct that person either towards isolation or towards quarantine, which I'll talk about in just a moment. If the person is a student who needs to isolate on campus, either because they live on campus or because they are unable to appropriately isolate in their own home, then we work with our really incredible colleagues in Res Life and housing who have set aside um, rooms for, this, uh, for isolation and quarantine for the fall, have arranged for food to be delivered. ASH will continue to do symptom monitoring and education and information for those students. They will be well taken care of. If somebody in isolation uh, who has tested, faculty, staff, or students, test positive for COVID, they then become what we call an index case or a confirmed case. That person will then be contacted by a professionally trained person who's working in close collaboration with Los Angeles County Department of Public Health. And that person will do what's called a case investigation. They'll run the, uh, the um, confirmed case through a series of questions, like where have you had your meals lately? Who have you spent time with? Have you been on campus? Where have you been on campus? And, and the job of that case investigator is really to determine a set of close contacts. The CDC defines close contacts as somebody who has been within six feet for at least 15 minutes of a known case of COVID-19. There are other definitions of close contacts, someone who shares a home with, someone who is an intimate partner of or a caregiver of, somebody who's tested positive for COVID-19. So the case investigator has developed a set of close contacts and passes those on to another group of professionally trained contact tracers. I know uh, many of you are already familiar with contact tracing. You know that it's a tool that public health professionals has, have been using for decades to try and contain disease such as this. So those close contacts, the contact tracers will call them. They will not disclose the identity of the person who has tested positive. That's something the privacy of those individuals is really central to our efforts here as well. And I hope we have a chance to talk a little bit more about that. They will call these close contacts. They'll inform them that they have been exposed to somebody who has tested positive for COVID-19. They'll be directed to get a test and directed on how to get a test immediately and also directed to self-quarantine or isolate. 
Let me just pause for a second and talk about the distinction between those two terms. Quarantine is for people who are asymptomatic. That is, they don't have any symptoms that are consistent with COVID-19. The period of quarantine is 14 days because that's considered the period of incubation for COVID-19. If they develop symptoms or begin with symptoms, they're placed into isolation for 10 days and they're not released from isolation until a number of other factors have been met, so many days free of symptoms, et cetera. So the close contacts will be tested, placed in quarantine or isolation. If one of them should test positive, then we start up again with a new index case where case investigation takes place, close contacts are developed, and you can see how this web then begins to spread. In this way, we're able to quickly identify, test, contact trace, and isolate to help contain this virus. Another key component of our um, strategy has to do with surveillance testing that Dr. Katona spoke about. Surveillance testing is really identifying higher risk groups like athletes, perhaps those in the performing arts, and testing them regularly, uh, those who are asymptomatic, to kind of keep a close eye on if a, a case should develop. Similarly, surveillance testing could be for large groups of asymptomatic folks. So, for example, students who are living in residence halls on campus will likely be tested upon arrival to campus and on regular points thereafter. Currently under discussion by the infection disease experts are testing all students when they return to campus, even those who live in the surrounding areas who need to come onto campus, and testing faculty and staff in an ongoing surveillance approach. Surveillance testing really helps us to quickly identify, given the kind of asymptomatic shedding that Dr. Katona spoke about, to quickly identify cases and to put them through the process that I just spoke about of contact tracing and isolation. It also gives the campus leadership a really good sense of the prevalence of the disease on campus. You know, we are going to have COVID-19 on campus in the fall. We have it now. What's key is that we continually emphasize that prevention efforts, appropriate distancing, always wearing face coverings, regular hand washing, the things that will help prevent you giving it to me and me giving it to you, those are the foundations of our campus strategy. Built upon that foundation is this very rigorous, well-coordinated identification, testing, contact tracing, and isolation efforts. And if all of us give our absolute commitment and buy-in to these uh, processes, we have our best shot at containing this disease. Thank you so much. And that now takes us to the Q&A session. Uh, John, thank you very much. And, um, and I want to echo the importance of all everyone's commitment to doing what we, we can together to mitigate the risk. Um, I um, will uh, start asking with the first question. And I think probably this one's for Peter. But anyone, please feel free to chime in. Um, what's the latest update on uh, developments of a vaccine and its availability, a COVID-19 vaccine? Well, we're in uncharted territory here. You know, we've never developed a vaccine this quickly. They generally take five, 10 plus years to develop. And it, production is very, very complicated. Uh, to do it quickly, you need almost a Manhattan project to get it done. A lot of steps are involved and any one of those steps failing crashes the whole process. You've got to pick a promising candidate. You've got to go through phase one, two, and three testing. You've got to get FDA and other approvals. You've got to get production on an unheard of scale started. You've got to do marketing to those that are unconvinced. You start thinking about worldwide distribution, hoarding, politics. The anti-vaxxers will get into it. And there'll be potential post-marketing complications like we had for dengue vaccine. So there's a lot of things involved and any one step can be fatal. There's more than 100 candidates now, dozens in clinical trials, 
and lots and lots of money being directed to it. For pandemics that are coming, the quote was, it's not a question of if, but when. For vaccine, it's not a question of when, but if, because we don't know whether there'll be a vaccine that's going to be effective for older people that will give total and not partial immunity uh, that will be long lasting and will be cost effective. So lots of issues to consider. We're nowhere near yet. I think we're guessing when we say 12 months or 18 months, it's gonna take a while. Thank you, Peter. I have um, the next question. And by the way, thank all the participants. The questions are coming in fast and furious. So obviously many of you are interested. Uh, this is a two part question for Michelle. Uh, part one is, is it possible to create a fact sheet in an easy to use checklist format for those in the UCLA community who might need to use the standard operating procedure? Could roles and responsibilities be outlined by a group such as a PI or leadership in HR? And then part two is, can HR directly receive cleared to work certificates received by their employees or confidentially receive notification when someone is not cleared to work? Thank you, Roger. So for question one, uh, we have actually been in conversation uh, within the Emergency Operations Center about potentially modifying the SOP for clarity uh, and also to include additional instruction on reporting and notification. Uh, now that we've had a bit of a trial run with the existing language uh, and feedback has been received from departments that have had to report COVID positive cases. Of course, these situations tend to involve a number of variables uh, and reporting isn't always cut and dry. And I know we've seen similar challenges with the EHNS serious injury hotline, uh, though we have managed to iron out most of the kinks to that process now that it's been about six or seven years. Um, but yes, we can certainly revisit the SOP and see what added clarity uh, can be integrated into the document uh, to make more improvements. Uh, and then for question two about clearance certificates, uh, currently there is no automatic uh, notification that is issued to supervisors about an employee cleared versus not cleared status. Uh, on the other hand, some areas have uh, chosen to request to see copies of the, the clearance certificates from their employees, um, either printed or through a mobile device uh, upon arrival to a campus facility. Uh, we are in the process of exploring a more systematic process that could allow supervisor access to the certificates via a secure file transfer platform uh, at their leisure. Uh, if, if this solution checks out and all considerations, including privacy uh, and data handling, check out, this method could alleviate much administrative burden and would facilitate a smoother case investigation and contact tracing process. So yes, we are continuing to explore those options. Great, uh, th thank you, Michelle. Um, next question, probably for Narit. Um, what is UCLA doing to reduce COVID-19 transmission risk in indoor settings, like increasing ventilation and air filtration? Yeah, absolutely. So um, UCLA Facilities Management has been, again, working with leaders across UC and other universities, as well as consulting CDC industry standards from ASHRAE and relevant groups to determine the best practices for our buildings. Uh, we will be increasing air changes in areas where appropriate. Um, I've had some questions around windows. Our buildings are not designed for natural ventilation, so we are not recommending people open the windows. It actually impacts the air balancing for the building negatively and, and is not helpful. Um, but yeah, this is something we're continuing to monitor closely and we'll continue to adjust as standards uh, change as well. Thank you very much. I have a question now. I'm sure this is for John. And actually, I'm going to merge it with another question I just received. But John, should departments try to do their own contact tracing if they know of someone who has tested positive? And I noticed multiple questions coming in. Who are these contact tracers? Thank you, that's a very helpful question. We've been asked this question before about the role of departments when they become aware of someone who's tested positive. Uh, it's really important that departments do not do their own contact tracing. And there's a few reasons for this. One is 
you want trained professionals to take on this task because there are really important components to it. And I'll talk about the training in just a minute. Another reason is that we want to protect the privacy of the person who's tested positive. If departments start getting involved, they're less, it's less likely that you're going to be able to protect the identity of the person who's tested positive. And finally, what's much more important than the department taking on any effort like that is the department becoming aware of this, that they quickly report it to the appropriate place on campus. You can always call the ASH Center, but Occupational Health for Faculty and Staff the ASH Center for Students. So our contact tracers go through a fairly rigorous training program that is led by some of our colleagues, professors in the public health school and also at University Extension. It is called the Academy and it's, um, it is the place that all, um, that many of the county departments of public health send their contact tracers for and to have this team trained. We have identified seven full-time uh, people on campus thus far. That will expand as needed um, as we get into the fall. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much. Um, the next question, um, sort of a combination of two different questions, and maybe, maybe Michelle, you could, you could start it off, um, has to do about the reporting and accuracy of of the symptoms when people report, suppose that's not accurate, that's that's being um, being uh, input into the questionnaires. And a related question has to do with visitors. What about visitors uh, to campus? Uh, uh, you know, wh what about um, risks associated with that? Thanks, Ron. So the Qualtrics Symptom Monitoring Survey is currently under largely an honor-based system. So we are relying heavily on the participants to uh, enter honest uh, responses to the survey when they are completing them prior to each shift. Uh, with regards to visitors, uh, we are looking into a process now where we will likely expand the UCLA non-affiliate campus instance to include visitors. We're sorting out the details in terms of what that scope could look like and how it would be managed. Uh, and in terms of en enforcement and compliance, uh, we've had several conversations around that topic as well. Uh, we do have a newly formed uh, enforcement and compliance working group under uh, Dean Brookmeyer's Future Planning Task Force in which we all participate. So we hope to get some clarity there and, and reach some resolution on both the student side, the employee, the faculty and staff side, as well as visitors. So great. Thank you very much. And so not to escape questions, I noticed there were several questions that I guess would be directed to me and I'll answer it very quickly. And they're asking about because of what's happening currently in LA, would we consider ramping research back down? And I think my quick answer is we're monitoring this very carefully and it might happen. We may have to back up from our, our ramp down, ramp up, I should say. So that's a short answer to that. Uh, this one I think is for Nuri. Uh, what about the protocols and procedures for individual office, offices where faculty are coming back on campus? Um, so there will be some physical distancing guidance for departments to help ensure that people are spaced out. Um, offices otherwise um, will be similar kind of cleaning protocols. I believe for offices that are off master, uh, it would be the responsibility of the office occupant, um, but otherwise uh, we will be servicing through custodial services. So hopefully that answers the question. If not, feel free to to ping our hosts in the chat again, and I can address any further questions. Great, thanks very much. Um, this one might be for uh, Peter. Um, will COVID-19 co confer immunity if you get it and you recover, and how long might you be protected? We don't know. Um, we know that some people have found some immunity, maybe nine months, maybe a little bit longer than that. We don't know exactly how long that immunity stays, and we don't have very good antibody tests right now to determine that. So we will know that in the near future, but at this point, we, we don't know. The, the educated guess is that there will be some immunity, but it won't be longer than a year. Okay, so I have a question that may be for John, but maybe uh, Peter might want to answer. There, there were a number of questions about 
symptom monitoring is great, but what good does it do if they're asymptomatic? I can start with that if you'd like. The symptom monitoring is going to capture a certain portion of the community that we're worried about, of course, those with symptoms. And even if they're not sure, it will hopefully direct them to call one of these lines where they can talk with a health professional and maybe figure out what's going on. And I think it's the surveillance testing, as we talked about, that really captures um, those who are asymptomatic and may be shedding. Yeah, it's very, very difficult because we don't have enough testing capability to get a good handle on asymptomatics and where they are in the process. And until we have more testing ability, it's going to be a big hole, a big unknown in our knowledge of what to do and how to act appropriately. Um, great, thank you. Um, question about um, custodial staff. Um, maybe this would be for Michelle and Narit. Um, are there specific um, mitigations that are being put in place to protect, uh, to reduce risks for custodial staff? Yeah, absolutely. Um, our staff are receiving specialized training um, and also, you know, where appropriate uh, using PPE. So we are very concerned, of course, with the health and safety of our employees, including our custodial staff. Um, so we are very focused on that. Yes, and we're also uh, in the process of reevaluating reevaluating the symptom monitoring protocol for staff and students. Uh, we are aware that there are several uh, university-owned housing areas that are serviced by our custodial staff. Um, and it, there needs to be some consistency in terms of who is symptom monitoring in those spaces. So again, we're reevaluating a, a better process to capture those needs. Okay, I have a question for Peter. And I, I'll rephrase it by saying, um, there's so much data out there. Can, can you tell me what I should be looking at to, to tell me as an individual, is LA getting better or worse? Because I'm confused. There is a lot of data out there and it's virtually impossible for all of us to keep up with it. Um, from all the indicators, it looks like things are getting worse in LA County. Cases seem to be going up, hospitalizations seem to be going up. Um, UCLA is pretty full with patients right now with COVID. So things look like they are getting worse right now if you look at all the trajectories. Um, so it's, it's gonna be a while before we get out of this. And uh, I just wanna echo, thank you, Peter, something that Roger said about how we continue to reevaluate both the research ramp up and, and the future planning task force in terms of re return of students to classrooms um, are looking at the data every day and pivot is a very you know, key word that we have to monitor and, and be flexible and, and look at the data as it comes in and continue to reevaluate. Um, question that came in um, and maybe Nurit on this one, I think, um, has to do with our classrooms and uh, occupancy of classrooms and what the spacing is and how many how many can you have in a classroom? So that varies a lot. We do have a small group that have been working very closely on this, including Frank Wada and the registrar. Um, so it depends on the classroom, uh, but the spacing will require at least six foot distancing. Um, so any classes that are held in person this fall will be spaced differently. So you will never have 70 people in a 70 person lecture hall. Um, things will be spaced very differently and classroom capacity and layout is done very differently. So I think this question's for Peter uh, and I think it came out in a few questions. So I'll summarize by saying really how accurate are these tests that UCLA are doing? What are, what are the possibilities of false positives and false negatives? There clearly are false positives and false negatives. Part of it has to do with just the accuracy of the test picking enough, enough viral particles. Part of it has to do with how you obtain the specimen. Part of it has to do with, with where in the course of the illness you've actually made, gotten your specimen. Estimates have been that up to 20 or 30% of cases are false. 
false positives and false negatives. So it's not nearly as accurate as people think in terms of the antigen testing, the, the PCR and the NAT testing. The actual antibody testing is much less accurate. Um, since we have such a low prevalence of antibody in the community, the predictive value of those tests is so small that they have virtually no value for an individual. They have some value for, for looking at large groups of people and seeing where we're kind of trending. But for the individual, the antibody testing has very little value. Great, thank you. Um, next question maybe for John. Um, we've been hearing a lot about digital apps for contact tracing. Uh, what's your view of that? Do you see a role for that at UCLA? Yeah, I mean, I think that UCLA should be at the forefront of innovative technology in dealing with this disease. The, the apps raise some concerns around privacy, uh, but the basic way that they work is the, the person has to opt in to the app it will sort of track their interactions with people. And if they were with someone who also has the app within six feet for at least 15 minutes, and that person then later tests positive and self reports through the app, it will identify that as a close contact. So in, in a lot of ways, the, the, um, the technology it could be very helpful. And what we're doing now is we're at the stage where we are uh, selecting the technology platform overall for the management of, of the disease. And uh, app selection and utilization is gonna be one part of that. If I could add to that, um, many countries have successfully used these apps, both dictatorships and democracies. So it's not just a question of being forced to use them. And they've been helpful for contact tracing. They're not a substitute for contact tracing, but they're an adjunct which could have great value, especially when we're way behind other places in terms of doing this efficiently. Okay, let me ask a question that maybe I'll just share with the panelists and uh, Dean Brookmeyer, because I think it's a, it's a relevant question, but not that it has an easy answer. And I'll summarize it by saying, you know, students are gonna be students. And what about their extracurricular activities when they're not in the classroom? And, and advice you have on that because that could put the campus at risk. Um, I can try to speak to this. I know that we are working closely with student affairs to develop student trainings and, and potential outreach for the fall. I know that residential life will be very, very active. And so I think the campus will, as, as best as we're able, encourage students towards safer practices and discourage uh, socializing in ways that would put themselves and the campus at risk. But it's definitely a concern to all of us. The weekends are what we're worried about even more than the classes. Yeah. Anyone else want to take it? I know that was a hard question, but I think yeah. it's a good, it's a good well, question. Yeah, it's a critical question because, you know, um, you know, that particular age group of students, uh, you know, it's a high, you know, where one engages in high risk um, activities and it's going to be really critical to change the culture and that it's a shared culture that we need to all work together to mitigate risk. Um, we have a, a student life uh, working group uh, which is uh, leading the charge for um, how to um, how to get the message across and to change the culture. Um, and there is um, discussions underway about forming an ambassador program where we um, reach out and do education about uh, the different risks and how and what you can do to to help uh, lower risks not only for you but for your, your friends and your families. And so um, this is a really uh, important question and, uh, and uh, we, we, are, we need to uh, work on uh, that aspect of education and changing the culture, absolutely critical. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add to that, uh, that in our future planning task force meetings, which occur weekly, we talk about this constantly and the fact that we need to balance out you know, the public health mitigation efforts that must be taken with the student experience. 
of being in college. Uh, we do have a, a student representative on that meeting and in that task force to speak on behalf of the student population, which is very helpful. Uh, you know, in those discussions, we are also uh, contemplating triggers for de-densification. So if things get really bad, you know, we will have some sort of plan to say, okay, this is the point at which we do need to de-densify, we need to take action, we need to pivot. The question came in about information, um, uh, getting uh, where can you find reliable information about positive cases on campus and some information about, about that? Is there a comprehensive place where you can go to learn exactly what's going on at, at UCLA um, with regard not only to these protocols that you've been talking about, but specifically about um, positive cases that are coming to light? Yeah, I can answer that one. So strategic communications is part of our emergency operations center and very closely involved throughout this effort and response. Um, the positive cases at UCLA are kept up to date um, on the UCLA newsroom site, ucla.in slash coronavirus is the short URL. Um, we're gonna be transitioning to kind of an overall guidance ramp up sort of site that um, strategic communications has developed that will link to a lot of this key information. Um, but yeah, that, that case information is available now on, online. So again, I'll, I'll open this up to anyone that wants to try to answer it. It's, it's, a, it's a tough question, but again, one that is on a lot of people's mind, especially if you've been watching uh, the news lately. And that's about mask and, and sort of mask enforcement uh, maybe part of what I hear in some of these questions is what what are our attendees' responsibilities? What's the campus responsibility? What kind of messaging should we have for for mask wearing and those that perhaps refuse to wear a mask? I'd be happy to start off on this. I think all of us are kind of reluctant uh, as we see people in our neighborhoods or on our way to work to say anything to people but if we don't find a way to communicate with each other to encourage people to wear face coverings and to maintain distance we're going to very quickly get in trouble with this virus and so we've been talking about groups of, of um, students who would be not only checking to make sure someone's passed their survey but maybe also being an ambassador for safe distancing and for mask wearing i think we all probably need to get i'll speak for myself need to get a little bit more brave at just finding a kind and gentle way to say, hey, how about putting a mask on? That's gonna be so key. Yeah, I'll add to that, that in our physical distancing working group, we've been developing signage for campus and that includes signage around face coverings. Um, it is an order, it is a health order that face coverings be worn uh, at all times um, on campus, You know, perhaps with the exception of someone alone in, a, in an individual office with the door closed. Um, but walking across campus, et cetera. So currently we already have signs at every building entrance, and we're now going to be doing larger signs uh, at key campus entrances, parking structures, et cetera, that make it very clear that if you're going to enter UCLA, you need a face covering, you need to maintain physical distancing from people, and um, you know, please do not come to UCLA or our buildings if you have symptoms as well of respiratory illness. I might add to that, um, Places like Vietnam, which have had zero deaths, um, have a policy where they encourage, they do a lot of things, but one of the things they did was they basically encouraged people to wear masks by showing it was a social responsibility and it was a large public service outreach program that did that. We may not be able to do the same thing, but it's an example of something that was done and was very effective. Yeah, and there is also discussion we should note about uh, potential disciplinary measures and or student code of conduct measures related to not following these public health orders. So um, we want to change the culture, we want to encourage, but we also are considering that sometimes there may need to be other types of enforcement. Great, thank you. That was a hard question. Anyone else want to tackle that one? Um, so this question might be for either John or Peter, I think. How long does it take to get a test result? Right now we are, um, the lab we're using at the medical center is, is uh, providing results within 24 hours. 
In a surveillance testing situation, those are lower priorities, especially as the prevalence increases. So we've had some wait times as much as uh, five to seven days to get test results in a surveillance situation. This is why we're so concerned about beginning a broader surveillance program, because if we don't get test results back fairly quickly, there's not much benefit to that kind of a, a program. But the, 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 um, the benchmark and really the goal is a, a result within 24 hours. And so far with symptomatic cases, we're getting that. Okay, I think this is a question for Peter. And Peter, I'll, I'll preface it by saying we're not going to hold you to your answer, but it's a question that's on a lot of people's mind and, and you're an expert like many others. When are we going to return to a new normal? Uh, when is that going to happen? I think it's going to happen slowly. It's going to happen at different rates at different places. And it's going to happen differently at different places different cities in, in, in California, different places around the world. And it's going to take a year or two to start, and then it's gonna take probably a decade to kind of go back to what we think is okay and what we had before. So it's a very, very slow process. My predictions are probably as worthless as anybody else's. <laughs> but, uh, but I think it's gonna take a long time. This is an, a situation that is unprecedented. And so what's going to happen, all the unknowns that are going to happen are also unprecedented. There are all these unknown unknowns that are going to intervene and are going to make the prediction of this kind of thing very, very difficult to justify. Great. I saw a, uh, it was uh, one of the questions, and actually I'd read this article, someone wrote about um, the phrase, don't share your air. And uh, uh, it was sort of a, a messaging, and I was wondering if you could comment on that phrase, what it means, don't share your air, and, and, and how it relates to mitigating risk. You had respond to that? Well, it could be part of a public service message. It, it, it certainly means, you know, let's not get too close. Let's not go talk face to face. Let's keep our distance. You know, one has to kind of do it in a way that catches people's attention and catchphrases catch people's attention. And so things like that, I think, are a good way to go. Okay, so I will ask this question and answer it myself because it's, it, again, is, I think, uh, Ron Brookmeyer sort of mentioned this, but people are asking, is it possible that we would go to fully remote in the fall quarter? And certainly that is on the table. Everything's on the table. And I know the, these people that are uh, the panelists and others are looking at this very carefully. So uh, even though we have made a statement about coming back partially in the fall quarter, that, that doesn't mean we're necessarily held to that. We're always looking at the the health and well-being of um, the UCLA population. So I don't know if anyone wants to add to that, but try to make sure that we do provide an answer to that. Yeah, Roger, I'll add to that. Uh, we are also still awaiting the official okay from the county to do that, to return in fall. And even when uh, that is received, UCLA has to make a decision as to whether or not it would be appropriate to do so. So there are a lot of different um, uh, there are very um, competent stakeholders at UCLA who will be making that decision. It won't be done in a vacuum. Great. Thanks, Michelle. Yeah, I just want to add to that that, you know, at the first level is the state uh, and, and they set a threshold and LA County can set an even higher threshold before we can return to campus uh, in terms of classroom teaching and UCLA can then set an even higher threshold for that. And so there are different uh, phases and levels in this. And, uh, and I, you know, the key word here is pivoting, uh, because as we saw today, um, you know, the governor um, uh, uh, reversed course on restaurants, uh, in, in, in uh, dining in restaurants, and so there are changes that happen as we look at different trends and, um, and pivoting and monitoring the data is, is essential 
um, and we respond and we respond accordingly to try to um, lower risk as much as we can. Um, so um, next question would be, um, for um, the cleaning of classrooms and laboratories, how, how effective will the cleaning be done? Will it be done after each class and or each lab? Um, at, what, um, at what level will the cleaning be done? And will it be adequate? So maybe this would probably be for Nurit. Yeah, so um, for the professional custodial cleaning of these spaces, um, you know, looking at what's being done at different universities and what the best practices are, it's really not possible to send custodial staff into classrooms in between classes. Um, so we'll be doing twice a day, once during the day and once at night. Um, but the, uh, the, the strategy that we're finding is um, kind of becoming industry standard is to provide disinfecting supplies and guidance um, so that students and faculty will have these wipes available and can wipe down the spaces um, as they come in. Um, and as they leave the classroom. So that, that is the plan to ensure that in between classes, even when there's only a brief passing period, disinfection still takes place. Okay, and, I think, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, and that lines up with the CDC guidance as well that recommends user-based disinfection in addition to the cleaning um, by custodial staff. Okay. Um, this is a good one. I, again, I think this is probably for Peter. I'll summarize it or rephrase it as, as, as if we don't have enough to worry about, what about when we throw in the flu season in the fall? Uh, what, what are we gonna do? Give me some advice. Well, I'd make sure that as many people as possible get vaccinated by hopefully a vaccine that covers that strain. Uh, so that's number one. Um, also, we do have a pretty good rapid test for flu so we can differentiate flu from COVID fairly quickly in a, in a facility um, and that will help somewhat if they have a positive flu test. That doesn't rule out a COVID test but at least it helps a little. You know it could bombard us with a surge that we wouldn't be able to handle if all of a sudden uh, we can't handle all the combined cases. So it's something we dread happening in the fall. Um, but if it does, we'll just have to deal with it. Great. Audrey, can I just add that uh, we're expecting, have heard that there will be some sort of order or directive out of Office of the President that in, insofar as possible, all members of the campus communities be vaccinated. Uh, we have ordered um, 14,000 vaccines thus far for flu, and that's going to be a real part of our uh, welcome back to campus now. Some persons are at increased risk of serious COVID disease if they become infected. Um, can you say a little bit about who those people are and should they not be coming to campus at all under any conditions? That, that's a vitally important question because uh, people who teach on campus that are 65, 70, 75 years old uh, are they the ones who are, we want to kind of put into close contact with young students who are asymptomatic carriers? Um, so age is a huge issue that that's going to be need to be evaluated. Um, people with specific chronic illnesses are also important. Controlled high blood pressure may not be that important, but morbid obesity will be important. You know, having a history of cancer might be important, being on certain medications. So those things are going to be important to weigh in in terms of who is going to be on campus and who probably should be advised that they're going to be risking their health if they go on campus. Okay, uh, I know we're getting toward the end and, and maybe, I don't know, I'll, I'll look for Ron for advice, but this might be a good question actually to end on because I think everyone could offer an opinion. Someone is essentially asking, and again, I'll try to rephrase it, I am suffering from anxiety coming back to campus. Help me deal with this. I guess, assure me that things are gonna be okay if we are coming back to campus. 
So I think everyone must have an opinion on that on the panel. So I'll throw that out to you. I guess um, I understand that because I, I have that same anxiety, right? We're all kind of worried about this. And I think, um, I know in, in my area, which is student affairs, that my colleagues are, are so focused on wanting to make sure that this is a positive uh, experience returning to campus, but also a really healthy one. So there are a lot of people with really um, great intentions and good ideas about how to keep the folks stay, safe and to see this as a community experience and as much as possible to allay the anxiety that is going to be uh, inherent with, within all of us. So I, I, I trust those colleagues and, and I'm hopeful that that will help some. Yeah, I would second that. You know, I feel very confident and comfortable. We have some of the best, you know, medical and public health experts here at UCLA, and not every organization has a team like that to be able to advise their practices. So it does bring me comfort to know that there's such dedicated um, staff working on this. You know, I think it's natural that all of us are experiencing anxiety in this period. And unfortunately, none of us are able to guarantee 100% safety. We're all going to have some level of exposure, whether it's going to the grocery store or a workplace. Um, but I think the more you can educate yourself on both campus practices and you know, public information and mitigation procedures, the more comfortable you can feel that you're doing the best that you're able to. I would also really encourage people, if you missed it, there's been some really great emails from our Healthy Campus Initiative about kind of mental health and well-being during this period. It's so important to pay attention to that. And there's some really great resources through staff and faculty counseling and CAPS um, and would really encourage you to take care of yourself in terms of mental well-being as well as the physical and washing hands, et cetera. Okay. Others? I would only add to that that uh, anxiety is based on your transmission risk assessment and, and how you feel uh, risk is actually there and, and risk assessment is, is something that's uh, that based on what kind of information comes to you, whether you go to certain sources that give you correct information and certain sources that don't. So I think the messaging being consistent and based on what the facts are that we know to give people an honest assessment of risk is what we need to do to be able to make as big a dent appropriately on that anxiety. I, I would just echo again uh, all the terrific work that's being done by the Healthy Campus Initiative um, and all the excellent resources that are available um, for our faculty, staff, and students um, to provide support if they need it. Um, I think information is really good and, and I, I hope today has provided, um, provided very useful information. But let me just say, sometimes too much information can be overwhelming. And I think it's just a reminder that we all need a break from it. And, and you need a break from COVID. Uh, it is overwhelming. And it's so important to take care of yourself, give yourself some space, you know, get, you know, take a break, um, get outside um, and, and take care of yourself. And, and that is really, really important. So, um, and we're all in this together. Great. Michelle, maybe give you an opportunity if you want to add anything. Yeah, I, I will add that uh, there will definitely be anxiety around this situation. This is not something that we've ever experienced and there's just so much outside of our control. So I, I recommend to focus on the things you can control. Focus on educating the people around you. Uh, I, I think I saw a message in there about children. I have children myself, uh, some small children and then one in college. So there's a lot of risk there uh, because kids will be kids. So as I said, just try to focus on the things you can control and educate the people around you the best that you can. Great. So I think this does bring us to a close because I see it's 429. I, I simply can't thank uh, Dean uh, Ron Brookmeyer and all the panelists for participating and for all of you that tuned in. I, I, I thank you all for joining it. I, I hope you found it informative. I, there were well over 100 questions <laughs> that were submitted. So I just it's amazing. We are going to try to answer uh, more than what you heard today by posting them on the website. So look for that. Uh, hopefully the video will be up on there in a few days. 
there will be a post-event survey. I hope you take some time to uh, fill it out. Uh, and lastly, you know, I thought it was going to be a, a much more upbeat message when I originally thought about it. Please enjoy the 4th of July. However, every time I look at the LA Times and read the news, something else is being closed down. But I, I still think you should have a wonderful three-day week, and I certainly will try to decompress a little bit. So thank you all very much, and, and take care.